When renovating a property, there are some things that will add massive profit to your renovation, and there's some things that actually cost more than what you're going to get in return. So it's important to understand what is the best way to maximize your return on renovation. Today I have with me Jane Slacksmith from the Ultimate Guide to Renovation, who has successfully completed multiple renovations herself and now trains her students how to mimic what she has done and to successfully profit from renovations. We're going to go step by step, room by room through the house and find out, well, what can we do to add massive value and to maximize our return on renovation in each area of the house? This is a great interview and I learned a lot from Jane in this interview about what we can do in different areas and what we can do to maximize our return on renovation. So here's my interview with Jane Slack Smith from the Ultimate Guide to Renovation. Hey guys, Ryan here from onproperty.com.au, your daily dose of property education and inspiration. And today I'm excited to have back with me Jane Slacksmith from the Ultimate Guide to Renovation. We're going to be going through the nitty gritty of renovation in this episode, talking about how to maximize your return on renovation, but we're going to be going through each room individually, the bedrooms, the bathrooms, the kitchen, all of that sort of good stuff to find out exactly what you can do to maximize your return on renovation. So thanks so much for joining us today, Jane. My pleasure, Ryan. Okay, so where do we get started when we're going to go through room by room, how do we maximize our return, but where do you think we should look at first? Look, I think um, if we start big picture, let's start really big picture in the fact that there are many, many different types of renovations. So I have what I call as my five R's of renovation. So I've simply got the refresh. And this is the kind of property you walk into and you see people walk out and go, oh my God, did you smell that? Did you, oh, how dirty was that? And you're like, oh, there could be opportunity. Sometimes it is just a good clean. Like that's all the property needs. It just needs, you know, open up the windows, air it out. Someone's been there for 40 years smoking, there's stains on the on the ceiling, whatever. It's a refresh. And this can be less than $1,000. You know, this is the elbow grease that goes into this. So that's my first hour of renovation. Then I have repair. And this is where you kind of have to pull out your toolbox. And we're talking about you're, you're fixing things up. So, you know, there might be some uh, doors hanging off the kitchen. There might be, you know, a little bit of painting and touch up. You might paint the bathtub for instance you know give it a clean look put on a, a new shower curtain new toilet seat you know steam clean the carpets you know it's we're not talking about a huge expense we're talking about the fact that you need to be doing some repairs to brighten and lighten this up and this is often what people do between tenancies as well so that repair and then we move on to well, you know, my favorite, which is kind of a combination of the repair and the refresh into the rejuvenate. And the rejuvenate is where we're talking about bathrooms, kitchens, and where we'll get into a bit later here where you can, you know, spend your money. But it's around, you know, new window coverings, painting the property, sanding the floorboards, you know, doing some landscaping. And that's where, you know, rule of thumb, people talk about around 10% of the value of the property is spent on that cosmetic rejuvenation. And then so, we have the restructure. Yeah, so is a rejuvenation, is that what a lot of people call like a cosmetic renovation? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, um, and, you know, you, sometimes you talk to people and they go, oh, they say you only need to spend, you, you should spend 10% of the value of the property on your renovation. I did it for $1,000, you know, it's all crap. Well, in actual fact, they probably just did a, re, you know, a refresh or a repair. They didn't do the replace the kitchen, bathroom, carpets, you know, and everything. So... So once we have that rejuvenation, our cosmetic renovation, we move on to the restructure, which is the structure. And we're talking about let's push over the back of the house and put out that nice open plan living space. So that's the structural. And that, you know, depending on who you speak to, you know, 30, 35, 40% of the value of the property would be spent on that structural renovation, timing it at least three to six months. And then if you've got a... a a council that's not so happy. <laughs> it could be 12, 24 months just getting approvals to do that. And then we have the revamp. And the revamp is one that I now have moved into. And um, it's, it's something that I think a lot of landlords and property owners forget. And this is go back to your original portfolio and see what you can do. So, you know, if I've got 40 grand saved up or 40 grand windfall or whatever, rather than me going, oh, gosh, you know, I know the median house price is 600000 I can't get anything there. I could possibly buy out of town 
percent on MAB two fifty three hundred property and stamp duty, or you could go back to your current portfolio and go, well, you know, maybe I could spend. So, for instance, I've got a, a tiny, oh my gosh, tiny little terrace in Darlington in New South Wales and Sydney. That's um, it was an old. Um, workers cottage and it's a tiny little two story now for thirty thousand dollars i can actually put an attic bedroom on top sacrifice a little bit of the second bedroom in um, on the second floor and for the six weeks of work that it takes they only need one week of internal work upsetting the tenants five weeks of it can happen on the outside and that wow. thirty thousand dollar little attic bedroom could add a hundred thousand dollars in value so a lot of people don't look at that revamp yeah, that's a very good one that people should think about once they grow their portfolio and go back to things. All right, so that's our high level. There's a lot of different ways that we can renovate. Uh, I guess I guess we should start on the outside because that's where people are going to be looking at when they first enter the property. What are kind of some of the ways to maximise our return on investment on the outside? Well, look, there's so many. I've actually written notes, so I apologise for reading all of these. But I think that um, as you as you mentioned, the outside there's there's so many uh, things that people forget. They forget that street appeal. So maybe rather than replacing the roof, maybe repainting the roof. So you know, I I have a demonstration of a of cosmetic renovation that I've done in some videos that are coming up. But they um, they actually re, you know the the roof is repainted for a thousand to three thousand dollars. You know, it gives it a, a little bit more maintenance, to look much better. But you didn't need to replace it. There's things like rendering outside walls. So you know, we've all seen driven down the streets of those horrible red brick suburbs. You know, yeah. rendering some of those properties and spending maybe you know five to twenty thousand dollars, depending on what you have. Even just doing the front of the property can add a lot of value. Um, fencing. You know, adding some nice fencing or even repairing and uh, propping up some old fencing so that it's got a few more years in it. Um, painting the concrete on the driveway, cleaning the driveway, maybe repairing the, the garage so the garage roof, you know, ties in colour scheme with the house so everything looks consistent, especially if it was post, you know, built. Um, and just doing things that, that make things look coordinated. So painting the exterior of the house and the fence so they match. You know, and then you know, just simple things that I would do and add value is adding maybe uh, you know latent pines, fast growing you know Mariah, fast growing plants that don't need a lot of uh, work or maintenance by your tenants, but are going to give maybe some privacy in the back, privacy in the front that are going to look good. So you know, for me, it's about uh, adding some value externally without breaking the bank because you know you really want to be spending your money where the big ticket big bang factors are and that is the kitchen and the bathroom okay so with the outside the goal i guess from what i hear you saying is to get a very clean and unified look to the front of the house so i guess it looks like it's been thought out and it looks like someone's been taking care of the property and it's in good yep. shape would you agree with that exactly. Absolutely, okay. and you know, people make the decision within the first 30 seconds of pulling up to a house whether they're going to, you know, rent it or buy it. So I'd be, I'm looking at first impressions. Yeah, well, even now people are making their decisions on the internet, just yeah. scrolling through the listings. And so if the front of your house doesn't look very good from the listing, they just keep scrolling and they won't even see it at all. So. Um, yeah, the internet is definitely changing things there. So you say the big ticket items are your kitchen and bathroom, which comes as no surprise to me. Everyone always says that, you know, the kitchen is the heart of the home and the bathroom is an area that needs to be done. Let's um, start with the kitchen because that's what I hear is the most important. What are some ways that people can maximise their return on their renovation in the kitchen area? Look, I think that, um, you know, we talk, we've talked you know the repaint or repair or remove kind of strategy when I'm looking at things often and especially in the lower price point um, of houses you know less than four hundred fifty thousand dollars I would be definitely looking at the maybe the repair or the paint option for fixing things so in the kitchen it might just be painting the bench tops removing the on your old-fashioned handles or removing the I think we talked about your, your mum and dad's place or the yeah. old dating kind of wooden trim veneer um, moving the the old fan that you know looks dates the kitchen maybe um, putting in a, taking a couple of the the doors off the top of the kitchen and putting in the glass face doors 
you know just adding a lift to it maybe just adding a nice glass splashback and you know you don't have to go and spend a fortune on these you can get these bunnings and ikea these days you know and one of the if we're talking a high-end kitchen type renovation you know i've um i've had people doing structural kitchens renovations and i've shown them how to save like forty thousand dollars by not custom making a kitchen but by doing a the you know, making the the pre-packed design kitchen size fit into the space that they have. So, you know, yeah. customising kitchens in the top end is really expensive. And, you know, a lot of people, once again, they get emotional. They want to put in that state-of-the-art hob and pizza cooking thing and the, I don't know, convection, I don't, you know, special type of cooking and, and whatever. But the, the actual, you know, if you're looking for tenants, then you're looking for something that's going to be maintained easily, something that you can get, you know, repaired quickly. You're not looking at the expensive European stuff. You're looking at the whirlpools, maybe that you know you can get any whirlpool technician out that can fix the thing quite easily. So, you know, for yeah. me, it's around um, people looking for cleanliness. They're looking for large, you know, uh, storage space and bench space, and they're just looking for a layout that they can work with. So you don't need to over-design the kitchen, but give it some wow factor. You know, if if the market wants Caesar Stone, give them Caesar Stone, but don't pay for Caesar Stone if the market's looking for a high-end Laminex. Yeah. So with the kitchen, so it really just depends on what you're doing in the kitchen, whether it's to rent it or whether it's to sell it, and depending on the area of the market that you're in. So if you're in a lower I guess lower price range, then it's probably not worth spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars redoing the kitchen, but it's better to just give it a paint. How would someone determine whether it's best, let's say they're in the middle range, like around what we talked about in the first interview we did, which I'll link up below, but if they're buying like 20% below the median price of an area, trying to get it above the median price of an area, how do they know whether they should just paint the kitchen or whether it actually needs to be taken out and put in a new one, whether that be custom or whether that be one from Ikea or wherever that you buy the standard ones? Um, it, 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 uh, one of the things that I do is that for every 10 properties I look at in an area, I then look at a property that is renovated to the standard that I think that the medium property should be at. So I'm trying to see the fixtures and finishes that that property has already got there and I'm listening to what people are saying as they're walking through you know uh, if they're really excited about the fact that there's a, a little door in the bench top that you can drop your your um, rubbish into into the bin below well you know that might be something I consider but if you know if I'm you know, walking around you know a western suburb area in most capital cities where you know we're talking about a nice home or unit for a family who are after functionality and maybe some security, etc., I'm not going to be putting in a, a nice little bench top hole in my nice bench top. I'm probably going to be painting my bench top and spending some money on some security bars for them. You know, they walk in and go, oh, this is the only place that has security bars. So, you know, I'm looking at, or, you know, it's got a, a carport. We really needed a carport, and none of the other properties have a carport. So I'm trying to find what's fit for the market. So if you have any doubts, go and find out what your competitors are doing because you're going to be on the market against them at some stage, but you're also going to be on the market against those that are renting. And that's why I'll also go and have a look at the properties that are renting at the moment at the rental price that I want and the standard of property that I expect to have and see what they're talking about. Yeah, so it comes back to tailoring your renovation to the market and what the market wants. And you can do that by seeing other properties and by... Yes. I like your strategy of going to these open houses and rather than looking at the property in intense detail, actually listening to the people that are looking at the property and hearing what they're saying because it's just such a good way to get a read on the market. If they're saying, mm. oh, you know, the other house we looked at had such a better kitchen, then, you know, you can get an idea of what people want and, yeah, it's just such good recon work, very sneaky. <laughs> and, and I even use the real estate agents as well. I'm, I'm all about sneaky and... Uh, but you know, going to the real estate agent in an open home for a property and saying, look, I'm looking to buy in the area. He's going to be going, ching, ching. Okay, here, here I have someone I can sell to. So what are people after? Because I noticed this house has 
da, 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 and like, nah, these guys, you know, media room was a complete waste of time. Everyone's talking about converting it into the baby's bedroom. It's like, okay, media room's not necessary. So you can actually use the real estate agents. You know, they're there. You, you may be buying off them. They are, they're going to be writing your name down. And, uh, you know, if you tell them exactly what you're after, they could actually then become a really great source of, you know, hey, this one hasn't gone on the market yet. But, you know, I know you're after a three bedroom fibro with the potential to add a fourth bedroom under the same floor plan. This is coming on next week. Do you want to have a look at it? You're like, yeah. yes. Awesome. That's good. So kitchen covered that. What about bathroom, which you say kind of goes in line with the kitchen as one of the most important rooms of the house? This drives me crazy because the bathrooms are often half the size or less of a kitchen but cost about the same amount to renovate because of the waterproofing and the tiny and you know how many you know trades you need there to get a, a, a good bathroom. So I'm always looking at you know saving money and maximizing my return. So once again, don't replace if you can repaint or repair. So simple things like painting the bathtub, changing yeah. the taps, you know, maybe changing the vanity. You know, sourcing sourcing vanities, you know, you might go to one manufacturer that has it that's selling a vanity for twelve hundred dollars and the same manufacturer on you know, there's an eBay um, supplier called um, Renovation D. So Renovation Reno D and they're an eBay shop. And they actually have vanities for two, three hundred dollars that are coming from the same um, place that Reese is selling theirs for twelve hundred dollars, the same factory in China. Yeah. You know, so maximize your return, get the the bling that might impress people, but make it functional. So, you know, simple things like, you know, I'm looking at tenants, I'm thinking, oh, they don't clean that well often. I'm not gonna have mosaic tiles that they have to clean the grout. I'm maybe going to have not gonna have you know, vanity that's on legs, I'm going to make it easy for them to get the broom and the vacuum under it and have it just wall hung, you know. So I'm not looking at things that could cost me money by hiding hiding the toilet behind the wall because if something goes wrong, I then have to get the wall off to fix the toilet. So, you know, I'm looking at things that A, are going to help me down the line in, in uh, minimising my maintenance costs, give me the wow factor that I, I need without, uh, you know, over overdoing it. Yeah, so I remember like painting the bathtub and stuff like that. Um, I've had someone come round to my place when I used to rent um, down in Burley and the bathtub just was all flaking off and he just came and painted it and sealed it and did everything and they didn't have to rip anything out or replace anything and I thought that was genius. And I've often uh, painted tiles to make yes. a massive difference in the bathroom. We lived in this house that was the bathroom. We called it the Winnebago bathroom because it had didn't have like proper walls. It had like these blue like tiger stripe walls that you think you'd find in like a camper van and it was just terrible. But we painted it with um just uh, – we got a bathroom paint, white paint, and just made the biggest difference to the bathroom yep. without costing us thousands and thousands of dollars. So people should always consider, you know, what they can keep and, you know, I guess upcycle or whatever you want to call it and improve before they go ahead ripping everything out and changing everything. If, if you do rip it out, maybe you can sell it as well. Sell it on eBay or Gumtree or something like that because yeah, then exactly. you can reuse that money to buy an awesome bath spout. I, I'm someone who does that. You know, I looked at the house once and I subsequently bought it, but um, there was something about the second shower and bathroom out the back in the laundry section that I was kind of like, there's something weird here. And they had, you know, you had those black and white kind of um, tiles, black and white yeah. tiles, so the and tiles kind of look like something a jester would wear in a court kind of thing, black and white. Anyhow, and I was looking at going, there's something weird here, and it, they weren't tiles. <laughs> the landlord had actually got um, a vinyl floor covering and actually just like stapled it on the wall, and that was the back <laughs> of the of the of the shower. I was like, there's something wrong. You just walk past and go, yeah, black and white tile. No, it's vinyl wall covering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so you never know what you're gonna what find. About, what about layout in a bathroom? Is layout important? Is there certain things that people want? Or again, is it do your research in the market, go and look at other properties and see what works and what's good there? Look, for me, you know, I'm trying to maximise my money. So I want to have something that creates value or, or is functional and looks good. But, you know, often I think, 
you get into that mentality of I've got to pull it all out and if you pull it all out you know I can then you know do the layout that you want. I I often use the layouts that I come across because I don't want to have to rerun the plumbing. You know, I pull off the wall to put the toilet in a different spot or something. Um, you know, I've done simple changes of layouts in rehanging the door opening into the bathroom from one side to the other side to actually give it more room to go in. You know, something as simple as that, getting a bit of builder's bog, filling in the holes, you know, rehanging the wall the door on the other side actually opened up this bathroom amazingly you know and so you know and I've used for high-end renovations I've used little um, uh, skylights to add add light as well down lights have done that but if you're looking at the low-end renovation you know the the layout itself I'd say try to work with the layout that you have and you know maximize what you have and it might be you know there's always the conversation should you have a separate shower and bath you know, find out what the market wants. Go out when you're looking at the rental properties and you're over, you know, overhearing what people are saying and they're going, oh, gosh, I hate it when the bath and the shower are together. Well, if that's an objection, you can you can override that. But if it's just, you know, well, this is typical for the area, you know, don't go and complicate things for yourself. Yeah, well, because that's the thing. Every renter that's going out isn't just looking at your property. They're looking at others as well. And if every other property has a shower over a bath, even if you have a shower over a bath, they're not going to go, oh, you've got a shower over a bath, I'm not going to rent your property because if they go anywhere else, that's what they're going to get anyway. So Exactly. And the yeah. reality is that often you're going to have to sacrifice the bath for the shower. So if you are going to, you know, remove something, you're in a small space, you not, you can't have two separate things anyhow. So it's like well, pulling the bathroom on the shower and then all of a sudden you're the only house in the street without a bath when, you know, the family of three are walking through going, well, where the kid's going to have a bath at night, you know? Yeah, well, I've actually looked at many properties as a renter and been like, yeah, no bath? No, nah, no, thank you because I've got kids and kids like to have baths and it's like that is the bliss time as a parent. <laughs> you put them in the bath, there's bubbles, they're so happy and I'm so happy. I'm See, not the, sacrificing that bath. <laughs> I should have taken you beforehand. My, my poor son has lived in so many houses without baths that now he's, his most exciting thing when he goes to his grandparents' or aunt's house is that, oh, can I have a bath? It's not like, you know, can we go and say hi? His first thing is in the bath. He stays there for an hour or two and, you know, he's all happy. <laughs> so. Yeah. We downsized to like a two-bedroom house. We're now upsized again because we're having another one. But we had this bath that it wasn't actually a bath. It was like a shower, but it had like a little basin and oh, yeah. the kids called it the puppy bath, but it still serves as a purpose for us. The kids could have baths, but yep. we couldn't. Okay, so bathroom, we kind of, in most cases, we're probably going to leave the layout the same. We try and reuse yep. as much as we can. Uh, if we are adding things, we want to get that wow factor, but for a good price. So look yep. around, shop around, uh, look on eBay, check out that Renault D or whoever it was that you mentioned. Yep. And I think that. And yeah, basically covers the bathroom. What about bedrooms? Because bedrooms, I guess most people, all I ever see people do in bedrooms is just paint the walls a neutral colour. Is that all that yep. is expected from a bedroom? That's all I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> I, you know, things like if we if we come to painting, just choose some colours that are neutral and non-offensive. You know, I I think that um, you know white a white kitchen is is easy people can put their own color splashes on it if you was going to save money and time I'd be looking at a single single color throughout the house I mean I have used the same color on most of my renovations and I put in a tiny little tin of the paint you know the kickboard under your kitchen yeah I keep everything in the kickboard so spare tiles I pull it off a spare tile a bit of paint paintbrush so if I have to run by a property between tenancies in the interstate I can fly in kick off the kickboard pull out my stuff it's all there that I can fix things up with there's a little tip for you but um, okay. antique white USA I use throughout most properties everyone uses that one everyone antique white you USA make sure you don't use antique white because it's like eight strengths um, deeper in color so it has to be USA um, I don't. I, I we've tried to do the um, the spray painting, and I've got to tell you, we're, we're not good at it. Some people are good at it. I don't think it gives a very professional finish. But if you're looking a high end property, I wouldn't be spray painting. But you know, maybe spray painting the ceiling and walls, or getting a, a painter who's experienced in doing that, can save you some money. Um, potentially, you know, you might. Um, I think 
there's things like you might accent a colour like there's a quarter strength colour called hog bristle that's nice complement to end white USA. You know, it's just to be honest, boring neutral colours. In the bedrooms, I'd be looking at you know maybe recarpeting, and I would go to get cheap end of roll carpets or discount carpets or carpets online or carpet auctions or you know graze online I've used a lot for different products as well and you know just just pulling off sometimes there's the carpeting places have had you know very big developments done and the developments have some end of rolls and you can pick up some really cheap carpet so you know um, I'm also looking at window coverings for the front of if the windows for the bedrooms are at the front of the house and for maximum street appeal, I might even spend, you know, $1,000 on putting plantation shutters in to give that kind of wow factor. But yeah, other than that, I'd, I'd be looking at, you know, maybe just simple blinds. I personally use 60 mil golden oak um wooden timber Venetians that I get from Spotlight. I join as a Spotlight member. I get my 10% off or whatever. And then once every six weeks, they do a two-for-one offer and it's on different blinds. And when they do the 60 mil, I go and pick up some. But I've got these these uh, timber blinds that have been in properties for 10 years and I'm still waiting to replace them, you know. They just – nothing can destroy them. Yeah, they do the job. And I thought I remember a really good tip that um, – because often, as we've talked about, people get emotional and they want to add splashes of colour to the bedroom, bright blue for a boy or pink for a girl or something like that, or put some wallpaper as a feature wall. And I thought a really good idea was even if you're painting it, well, we recommend you paint it that neutral colour, but if you want to add some flair to it, put some wallpaper in a frame or, you know, put a canvas on the wall or something like that. So it adds that colour and adds that vibrance to the room. But someone walks in and they go, yeah, I know I can take that painting off or that painting won't be there when I buy it. So you still got exactly. the neutral, so you appeal to the most people, but then it can still look great with that flair without alienating people away from your property. Which, you know, it brings me to kind of like the end point as well. One of the things that I talk about is staging a property. And this is often just for um, people who are looking to sell. So getting a professional stager in with, with as you say, you know, with the, the beautiful paintings, etc. And, you know, I think every property that I've renovated, we've lived in there to save money. And so whenever I look at the before and after photos, in the after photos, I've still got the old daggy lounge. Well, not daggy. I've got our lounge that's, you know, over the years gone with us to all these properties like, oh, and here's the lounge room. But um, staging a property, I actually approached a, a um, staging company and said, look, I'm I need to stage this property for a valuer. The valuer is going to be walking in for 10 minutes and they will be looking through this property. I want them to walk in and go, wow, imagine that you know, this is exactly what I perceive through all my research comparable sales of what it should look like. Tick, 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 yes. And I've, you know, they're not walking into an empty house. They're walking into a house that has been, you've got furniture in there. They go, well, I can imagine myself in that leather lounge, that fireplace with a red glass of wine, you know, at the end of the day kind of thing. And you speak to valuers and they always say to you, we are not, we are not influenced by furniture and staging or whatever. But there is an emotional human response that says walking through an empty house and you see it yourself when you go and do open inspections. You're more intrigued and interested when someone's kind of, you know, living there. And yeah. so you staging a property and, and I spoke to, I don't know, 10 stages and they're like, you don't get it. We stage for six-week campaign, you know, and... And I was like, oh, no, you don't get what I want. And I finally I got onto this guy and he's like, oh, yeah, I got it. I've got 27 houses. I staged them all. And I'm like, it's for the valuer. He says, I've got it. He said, look, our expense is picking up the furniture and dropping it off. You can have it for six weeks. I'm going to charge you the same amount. I'm like, well, oh, I kind of got tenants. I want to have a look through the property as well. I'm going to get some photos for that. Okay. And, you know, I think it was like $2,500 or something. And this value of this property, you know, I was – Oh, multitudes that I added value and got money out to go and do another property. The two and a half thousand, well spent. Yeah, so it's worth it. Even for a value art, it's worth getting that staging at the end just to make it look awesome. Because I remember, I know going into houses that are empty, all the blinds are shut, it's dark. Like, you don't feel like this is a house you want to live in, but you go in there, looks like someone's been living in it, someone pristine and yeah. super clean has been living in it. Uh, and and yeah, I don't totally. do that for high-end properties. I wouldn't do that for low-end properties. Like two and a half grand in a low-end property is going to get you floor sanding, which is going to be bang for your buck. So it could get your new bathroom, you know, tidy up and kitchen tidy up. So 
two and a half grand, you know, if I was going to waste waste that on staging, it would be at a higher end of property, you know, 650 or above. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, I know that we have been going for a while, so I'm going to end it there. We will be talking more about renovation and more about Jane's strategy of buying two properties, doing one renovation and getting a million dollars in the bank in an upcoming webinar that we have together on the 4th of March. You can check out that webinar. It's absolutely free by going to onproperty.com.au forward slash reno, R-E-N-O, and that's just a pure content webinar. We won't be selling anything at the end of that. Um, Jane, when we're talking about renovations in this upcoming webinar, what sort of things will we be touching on? Look, I'm going to be sharing my strategy that it basically shows that adding renovation to your property investing strategy and manufacturing wealth by doing that and manufacturing equity allows you to you know, kind of springboard into the next property or springboard towards your goals sooner. You can push up the rent so you're getting more money to help you hold a property, but you also have the capacity to get back in the market. And, you know, I really want to show how everyday Australians just with two properties, one renovation could put a million bucks in the bank in 15 years. And I tell my story of how, you know, I was able to, you know, change my life by being a renovator. Yeah, and I really like the idea that it's just two properties. It's not 10, it's not 30, it's not 130, it's just two. And I think Doesn't that have just to be makes complicated. It yeah, it just makes it simple. Let's make it simple for people. It doesn't have to be super convoluted and buy this and flip that and then do all this weird strategy and stuff. And then throw so. in and granny flats and buying in the US and, you know, dual key and mining towns. You're like, oh, my gosh. If I just have two properties in the right locations going up in value on manufactured wealth, you know, tick, don't have to worry about that, get on with life. Yeah, and I think that's what most people want. Most people want to get on with life. They want to have something that's building up for their retirement, building up to help replace their income. They don't necessarily want to be super fandangled in the way that they invest. They just want to know that it's going to work. And I love that your strategy. I love how risk adverse you are because I think there's a lot of people out there who are saying, yeah, invest in this, you get these massive returns. Uh, but there's not that many people out there saying, look, I'm a risk inverse investor, just like everyone else. Like, Let's learn what not to do and not do yeah. that uh, rather than just saying, well, here's some flash in the pan thing that you know, will make you a million bucks overnight. So I really appreciate that you're out there spreading that word and spreading that message because I don't think there's enough people doing it. So thank you so much for your time. Any closing words before we end this interview? No, I look forward to speaking to people on, on our webinar and, uh, yeah, bring your questions because I'll be happy to answer them. All right, and I look forward to that. Again, that's on the 4th of March, and you can check it out by going to onproperty.com.au forward slash reno, R-E-N-O, and it is a limited seating webinar. The technology only allows us to do a certain amount of seats, yeah. so it will likely fill up, so please get in quickly if you are interested. All right, Jane, thank you so much, and I'll see you on the webinar on the 4th of March. Okay, see you, Ryan. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Jane Sachs Smith from The Ultimate Guide to Renovation. I certainly did, and I always learn something whenever I talk to Jane, and I'm super stoked to get her on and to do these lessons and to do the upcoming webinar that I have with her on the 4th of March. If you want to check out that webinar, we're going to be talking more about Jane's strategy, two properties, one renovation, and a million dollars in the bank. It's a strategy that I love because it just sounds so achievable for the average person who doesn't want to buy 100 properties. And so I'm looking forward to sharing that. We've already had a whole bunch of registrations for that webinar. It's coming up very soon. Check it out. It's on the 4th of March, which is actually my daughter's birthday, but it'll be in the nighttime, so she'll be asleep anyway. But go to onproperty.com.au forward slash reno, R-E-N-O, before the 4th of March to sign up for that. If you're watching this after the 4th of March in 2015, well then go ahead and check it out anyway, because I'm going to have something special for you over there. Well, I've really enjoyed this series with Jane Sykes Smith talking about renovation, how to choose the right house. We talked about the biggest mistakes that renovators make. And we also talked about how to maximize your return on renovation. I've learned a lot from these interviews and I hope that you've learned a lot as well. So until the upcoming webinar or until I see you next, remember, stay positive.